Eros and Civilization, A Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 6, The Historical Limits of the Established Reality Principle. The preceding analysis tried to identify certain basic trends in the instinctual structure of civilization, and particularly to define the specific reality principle which has governed the progress of Western civilization. We designated this reality principle as the performance principle, and we attempted to show that domination and alienation derived from the prevalent social organization of labor, determined to a large extent the demands imposed upon the instincts by this reality principle. The question was raised whether the continued rule of the performance principle as the reality principle must be taken for granted, so that the trend of civilization must be viewed in the light of the same principle or whether the performance principle has perhaps created the preconditions for a qualitatively different, non-repressive reality principle. This question suggested itself when we confronted the psychoanalytic theory or psychoanalytical theory of man with some basic historical tendencies. One, the very progress of civilization under the performance principle has attained a level of productivity at which the social demands upon instinctual energy to be spent in alienated labor could be considerably reduced. Consequently, the continued repressive organization of the instincts seems to be necessitated less by the struggle for existence than by the interest in prolonging this struggle, by the interest in domination. Two, the representative philosophy of Western civilization has developed a concept of reason which contains the domineering features of the performance principle. However, the same philosophy ends in the vision of a higher form of reason, which is the very negation of these features, namely receptivity, contemplation, enjoyment. Behind the definition of the subject in terms of the ever transcending and productive activity of the ego lies the image of the redemption of the ego the coming to rest of all transcendence in a mode of being that has absorbed all becoming, that is foreign with itself in all otherness. The problem of the historical character and limitation of the performance principle is of decisive importance for Freud's theory. We have seen that he practically identifies the established reality principle, i.e. the performance principle, with the reality principle as such. Consequently, his dialectic of civilization will lose its finality if the performance principle revealed itself as only one specific historical form of the reality principle. Moreover, since Freud also identifies the historical character of the instincts with their nature, the relativity of the performance principle would even affect his basic conception of the instinctual dynamic between Eros and Thanatos. Their relation and its development would be different under a different reality principle. Conversely, Freud's instinct theory provides one of the strongest arguments against the relative, historical, character of the reality principle. If sexuality is in its very essence antisocial and asocial, and if destructiveness is the manifestation of a primary instinct, then the idea of a non-repressive reality principle would be nothing but idle speculation. Freud's instinct theory indicates the direction in which the problem must be examined. The performance principle enforces an integrated repressive organization of sexuality and of the destruction instinct. Therefore, if the historical process tended to make obsolete the institutions of the performance principle, it would also tend to make obsolete the organization of the instincts. That is to say, to release the instincts from the constraints and diversions required by the performance principle. This would imply the real possibility of a gradual elimination of surplus rep repression, whereby an expanding area of destructiveness could be absorbed or neutralized by strengthened libido. Evidently, Freud's theory precludes the construction of any psychoanalytical utopia. If we accept his theory and still maintain that there is historical substance in the idea of a non-repressive civilization, then it must be derivable from Freud's instinct theory itself. His concept must be examined to discover whether or not they contain elements that require reinterpretation. This approach would parallel the one used in the preceding sociological discussion. 
There, the attempt was made to weed off the ossification of the performance principle from the historical conditions which it has created. Presently, we shall try to read off from the historical vicissitudes of the instincts the possibility of their non-repressive development. Such an approach implies a critique of the established reality principle in the name of the pleasure principle, a reevaluation of the antagonistic relation that has prevailed between the two dimensions of the human existence. Freud maintains that an essential conflict between the two principles is inevitable. However, in the elaboration of his theory, this inevitability seems to be opened to question. The conflict in the form it assumes in civilization is said to be caused and perpetuated by the prevalence of Anank, Leben's not the struggle for existence. The later stage of the instinct theory, with the concepts of eros and death instinct, does not cancel this thesis. Lebensnot now appears as the want and deficiency inherent in organic life itself. The struggle for existence necessitates the repressive modification of the instincts chiefly because of the lack of sufficient means and resources for integral, painless, and toilless gratification of instinctual needs. If this is true, the repressive organization of the instincts in the struggle for existence would be due to ex exon exogenous factors exogenous in the sense that they are not inherent in the nature of the instincts, but emerge from the specific historical conditions under which the instincts develop. According to Freud, this distinction is meaningless, for the inst instincts themselves are historical. There is no instinctual structure outside the historical structure. However, this does not dispense with the necessity of making this, the distinction, except that it must be made within the historical structure itself. The latter appears as stratified on two levels. A, the phylogenetic biological level, the development of the animal man in the struggle with nature, and B, the sociological level, the development of civilized individuals and groups in the struggle among themselves and with their environment. The two levels are in constant and inseparable interaction, but factors generated at the second level are exogenic exogenous to the first and have therefore a different weight and validity, although in the course of the development they can sink down to the first level. They are not more relative. They can change faster and without endangering or reversing the development of the genus. This difference in the origin of instinctual modification underlies the distinction we have introduced between repression and surplus repression. The latter originates and is sustained at the sociological level. Freud is well aware of the historical element in man's instinctual structure. In discussing religion as a specific historical form of illusion, he adduces against himself the argument, since men are so slightly amenable to reasonable arguments, so completely are they ruled by their instinctual wishes, why should one want to take away from them a means for satisfying their instincts and replace it by reasonable arguments? And he answers, Certainly men are like this, but have you asked yourselves whether they need be so, whether their inmost nature necessitates it? However, in his theory of instincts, Freud does not draw any fundamental conclusions from the historical distinction, but ascribes to both levels equal and general validity. For his, meta for his metapsychology, it is not decisive whether the inhibitions are imposed by scarcity or by the hierarchical distribution of scarcity, by the struggle for existence, or by the interest in domination. And indeed the two factors, um, the phylogenetic biological and the sociological, have grown together in the recorded history of civilization, but their union has long since become unnatural, and so has the oppressive modification of the pleasure principle by the reality principle. Freud's consistent denial of the possibility of an essential liberation of the former implies the assumption that scarcity is as permanent as domination, an assumption that seems to beg the question. By virtue of this assumption, an extraneous fact obtains the theoretical dignity of an inherent element of mental life, inherent even in the primary instincts. In the light of the long-range trend of civilization and in the light of Freud's own interpretation, of the instinctual development, the assumption must be questioned. The historical possibility of a gradual decontrolling of the instinctual development must be taken seriously, perhaps even the historical necessity, 
if civilization is to progress to a higher stage of freedom. To extrapolate the hypothesis of a non-repressive civilization from Freud's theory of the instincts, one must re-examine his concept of the primary instincts, their objectives, and their interrelation. In this conception, it is mainly the death instinct that seems to defy and, hypo and or defy any hypothesis of a non-repressive civilization. The very existence of such an instinct seems to engender automatically the whole network of constraints and controls instituted by civilization. Innate destructiveness must beget perpetual repression. Our re-examination must therefore begin with Freud's analysis of the death instinct. We have seen that in Freud's late theory of the instincts, the compulsion inherent in organic life to restore an earlier state of things which the, which the living entity has been obliged to abandon under the pressure of external disturbing forces is common to both primary instincts, eros and death instinct. Freud regards this retrogressive tendency as an expression of the inertia in organic life and ventures the following hypothetical explanation. At the time when life originated in inanimate matter, a strong tension developed, which the young or organism strove to relieve by returning to the inanimate condition. At the early stage of organic life, the road to the previous state of inorganic existence was probably very short and dying very easy. But gradually, external influences lengthened this road and compelled the organism to take ever longer and more complicated detours to death. The longer and more complicated the detour, the more differentiated and powerful the organism becomes. It finally conquers the globe as its dominion. Still, the original goal of the instincts remains, return to an inorganic life, dead matter. Precisely here, in developing his most far-reaching hypothesis, Freud repeatedly states that ex exogenous factors determine the primary instinctual development. The organism was forced to abandon the earlier state of things under the pressure of external disturbing forces. The phenomena of organic life must be attributed to external disturbing and diverting influences. Decisive external influences altered in such a way as to oblige the still surviving substance to diverge ever more widely from its original course of life. If the organism dies for internal reasons, then the detour to death must have been caused by external factors. Freud assumes that these factors must be sought in the history of the earth we live in and of its relation to the sun. However, the development of the animal man does not remain enclosed in geological history. Or ge geological history, is that what I said? Man becomes, on the basis of natural history, the subject and object of his own history. If originally the actual difference between life instinct and death instinct was very small, in the history of the animal man, animal man it grows to become an essential characteristic of the historical process itself. The diagram on the facing page may illustrate Freud's construction of the basic instinctual dynamic. Um, so yeah, there's a big diagram. The diagram sketches a historical sequence from the, be from the beginning of organic life, stages two and three, through the form formative stage of the two primary instincts, five, to their modified development as human instincts and civilization, six to seven. The turning points are at stages three and six. They are both caused by exogenous factors by virtue of which the definite formation as well as the subsequent dynamic of the instincts become historically acquired. At stage three, the exogenous factors is, or factor, is the unrelieved tension created by the birth of organic life. The experience that life is less satisfactory, more painful than the preceding stage generates the death instinct as the drive for relieving this tension through regression. The working of the death instinct thus appears as the result of the trauma of primary frustration, want, and pain here caused by a geological biological event. The other turning point, however, is no longer a geological biological one. It occurs at the threshold of civilization. The exogenous factor here is Anonk, the conscious struggle for existence. It enforces the repressive controls of the sex instincts, 
first through the brute violence of the primal father, then through institutionalization and internalization, as well as the transformation of the death instinct into socially useful aggression and morality. This organization of the instincts, actually a long process, creates the civilized division of labor, progress, and law and order. But it also starts the chain of events that leads to the progressive weakening of eros and thereby to the growth of aggressiveness in guilt feeling. We have seen that this development is not inherent in the struggle for existence, but only in its oppressive organization, and that at the present stage, the possible conquest of man or of want makes this struggle ever more rational. But are there not in the instincts themselves asocial forces that necessitate repressive constraints regardless of scarcity or abundance in the external world? Again, we recall Freud's statement that the nature of the instincts is historically acquired. Therefore, this nature is subject to change if the fundamental conditions that cause the instincts to acquire this nature have changed. True, these conditions are still the same insofar as the struggle for existence still takes place within the framework of scarcity and domination, but they tend to become obsolete and artificial in view of the real possibility of their elimination. The extent to which the basis of civilization has changed, while its principle has been retained, can be il illustrated by the fact that the difference between the beginnings of civilization and its present stage seems infinitely greater than the difference between the beginnings of civilization and the preceding stage, where the nature of the instincts was acquired. To be sure, the change in the conditions of civilization would directly affect only the formed human instincts, the sex and aggression instincts. In the biological geological conditions which Freud assumed for the living substance as such, no such change can be envisaged or envis en envisaged. The birth of life continues to be a trauma, and thus the reign of the nirvana principle seems to be unshakable. However, the derivatives of the death instinct operate only in fusion with the sex instincts. As long as life grows, the former remains subordinate to the latter. The fate of the distrudo, the energy of the destruction instincts, depends on that of the libido. Consequently, a qualitative change in the development of sexuality must necessarily alter the manifestations of the death instinct. Thus, the hypothesis of a non-repressive civilization must be theoretically validated first by demonstrating the possibility of a non-repressive development of the libido under the conditions of mature civilization. The direction of such a development is indicated by those mental forces which, according to Freud, remain essentially free from the reality principle and carry over this freedom into the world of mature consciousness. Their re-examination must be the next step.